Okay, hey everybody, how you doing? Happy October once again from Teching and Barry. Today we're going to be talking about the Straw Hat Crew's dreams. The things that drive them from island to island. What they want most out of this epic adventure on the Grand Line. And I thought it would be very pertinent to start off this video by declaring to the heavens. All of us are going to declare and shout to the sky what Luffy's dream is, okay? So I'm going to back up for this one because it's going to get very, very loud. Um... You know what I'm going to shout, right? Like, everybody's on the same page with what this is going to be. All right, okay, I better hear the mighty shouts of this all over the world at once. In case you still don't know what- It's like, Teching, I don't know, I'm getting really nervous here, I don't know what you're gonna say. All right, it's cool. Luffy says it at the end of every episode. Literally go and watch any episode with Luffy at the very end of the episode preview he says this. It's basically Luffy's catchphrase next to Sanji, give me meat! I <laughs> So we all we're all on the same page of what he's gonna say. What I'm gonna say, right? Okay, cool. Ready? Alright. Three, two, one, four, five. Kaizakuoni! Oriwanara tumble! Yeah! Alright, the world of dreams, everyone. It's a very prevailing theory in One Piece. They contain many secrets inside of them. Also, they might contain Freddy Krueger. It is getting close to Halloween, so watch out for that guy. Um, I had a dream last night that was absolutely terrifying. I had a dream where I was in a park, and uh, there was like a little gazebo in the park, and there was this giant giant wasp's nest in the gazebo like it was huge like you ever see those videos of like people's old like sheds or whatever like bees or wasps just take it over and they have a giant wasp nest like that was basically this thing and i'm like everyone's around me and i'm just like what are you guys doing in this park there's a giant wasp nest and so i picked up these giant like these huge things of like a uh, bug spray of like raid or something and it was terrifying because wasps started coming out and at first they were regular wasps they were really small and i'm like spraying them and they're falling and then they slowly started to get bigger and bigger like these giant monster alien wasps were like yeah like come on you know like so it was like again and again and every time i turned my head to be like wow that was a really big one this other one the size of like a cow would like jump at me and it was so realistic it was truly truly horrifying but the straw hat streams are not nearly nearly that horrifying <laughs> all right so um this is how we're gonna do this okay we're gonna go through each of one of the straw hats dreams we're gonna talk about um what their overall dream is and what that might involve and how they're going to achieve it we're also going to talk about the difficulty of uh, achieving their dream spoiler alert i just have a feeling that oda is going to have all the straw hats realize their dream unless one of them dies so, uh, that, that might, well, Brooke kind of already did die, so yo! So there you go, you don't have to worry about that, right? Uh, so we're gonna gauge the difficulty, and in order to properly gauge the difficulty, I created this little meter down here. Alright, on a scale of 0 to 10, ranked, of course, by, uh, very prominent One Piece characters, because Gaimon is, of course, a very prominent One Piece character. So Gaimon's gonna be at 0, and then you got Foxy, and then you got Luffy right in the middle, and then you got Akainu, and then you got Kaido. Don't think too much into this graph of like, where, where's Shanks at? Where did, where'd you put Mihawk? It's just supposed to be like a basic visual representation of really strong characters in the story. I, I didn't put that much thought into like, you know, every single Yonko is going to be on here or something like that. Honestly, I don't even think Foxy on this scale should be as high as he is, right? He should really be like 0.5 on this scale. But essentially, Gaimon is at zero because he has basically no battle prowess whatsoever. So that's a very, very easy draw dream to achieve it would basically be like my dream is to go outside and i don't know just lay in the grass and stare at the clouds like okay that seems like a pretty easy dream in most aspects to achieve you know unless you live in a place that doesn't have grass or doesn't have a sky or uh you know you're you you're you're uh, trapped on a boat like brook for the majority of your life which is currently an unlife. Yeah, so I guess that I guess in that certain context that'd be rather difficult. All the way up to Kaido, number 10, very very difficult dream to achieve. Like I want to be the first person to I don't know, populate Jupiter. I'd be like, well, I could think of a few problems with that, but uh hey, you try it. You 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 got the you got the ambition and that's all that matters. Okay, all right. So let's start off with Luffy. All right, let's get the big one out of the way first. Luffy's dream is to become Kaizuko Oni Oriwinar, King of the Pirates. All right, now, 
This is something that has been already done before, so there is some precedence for this. This isn't like Luffy out of nowhere. This has never been said before. This has never been stated before. I want to be King of the Pirates. No, Goldie Roger became King of the Pirates, so that at least sets up a very... Uh, it, it's a very simple framework on how to get there, but it's very complicated at the same time. The simple way to become King of the Pirates is all you got to do is journey to the end of the Grand Line, find all the road poneglyphs, find Laugh Tale, and claim the One Piece as your treasure. You know, the same thing that Roger did. And once you do that, you will become King of the Pirates, just like Roger became King of the Pirates. So yeah, in in the you know context in that way, it's just a very simple like step one, two, three, four. But each of those steps are insanely difficult. All right, um, but it has been done before in the story and Luffy definitely has the motivation to get it done and he's got a really great crew which is going to help him out along the way they got a reliable ship the Thousand Sunny Nami's a great navigator Usopp's a great sniper Sanji's a great cook Frankie's a great shipwright everybody's really helping him out there he's referred to as the fifth emperor so he's getting a lot of clout in the world right now after this battle at Onigashima he's probably going to have even more in the world he's got a bounty of 1.5 billion so if you're going to say, if there's going to be anybody in the world that's going to find the One Piece and become King of the Pirates, it would most likely either be Luffy or one of the Yonko. And I'm doing a whole series on the channel right now about what would happen if other Yonko found the One Piece and became King of the Pirates. Shanks' video is next, by the way. Um, so overall, I'm going to say the difficulty rank right here on this chart. I'm going to have to go Kaido on this one. I'm going to have to go number 10. Just because Roger was an insanely strong pirate. He was kind of the best pirate that ever did pirate on the seven or eight seas of the One Piece world. Yarg, mateys! And he still barely found the place. Like, he found the place, like, very shortly before he ended up dying of this disease. Um, and he had been journeying for decades before that. So, yeah, put that in perspective there. Now, now granted, Roger didn't really have, like, a, a framework for this. Roger had to kind of discover all this stuff on his own. Luffy at least understands, like, okay, I need to find Laugh Tale. That's where it's at, all right? They didn't, like, even Roger didn't really know that, okay? Roger just kind of had to go along with how this went. But he still journeyed for decades. Luffy's only been on the sea for less than a year pre-time skip and only a few months post-time skip, so Luffy's only really been an active pirate captain for like a year and a half around there at best. So, you know, for him to find the One Piece without another huge time skip happening in the story, it's going to be very, very difficult. But, you know, that's why Luffy wants to do it. He doesn't want to do an easy dream. He wants something that's going to be very difficult and something that only one person in the history of the world has ever really accomplished. So he's like, yeah, let's do that, of course. And at the end of the day, as a little caveat to Luffy's dream, it's important to mention, and I've said this plenty of times whenever I talk about the One Piece treasure itself, Luffy is not really interested in what the treasure is. It doesn't matter. It could be a mountain of gold. It could be the ancient weapons. It could be like, well, okay, if it was an endless supply of meat that was, like, perfectly preserved, like, something ripped right out of the Toriko universe, I think Luffy would really, really, he's like, wow, I, well, I, I thought it was gonna be great, but I didn't think it was gonna be godly, you know, something like that, but no, even if the One Piece was literally just, like, a sticky note left over from Roger that said, you know, the journey was the treasure, good job getting here, mateys, you know, my hat's off to you, even if that's all it was, and Luffy was like, oh, Okay, like, he would just be like, well, the adventure was really, like, you know, I mean, the adventure itself was the treasure in that sense. But the One Piece is, of course, going to be something more than that, Oda said as much. But in terms of Luffy's perspective, it really doesn't matter. It's just the idea of going on this grand adventure and trying to get somewhere that no one else has ever been except for Roger himself. So I have to put it as number 10 because that's, like, the whole premise of the entire damn story um, for Luffy to find this damn treasure in this island, right? So we'll, we'll see where that goes from there. Moving right along you know what let's just gonna go down i was gonna go through like you know luffy zoro nami like in the actual story but let's just go around here next up is nami's dream okay so nami wants to make a map of the world now this is this is not like a dream where like luffy wants to find a location sanji also wants to find a location okay the all blue right so nami's thing is a little bit more passive in that it's not like nami can like oh I found this singular object or this singular location, therefore my dream is achieved. Um, she literally, this is something she has to work at. It might be like, Usopp's is a little bit more like that as well, like to be a brave warrior of the sea. Uh, Robin wants to find the Rio Poneglyphs and stuff, so when she finds the Rio Poneglyphs, she would know about the Void Century, of course. Frankie's is another big passive one because he wants to get the Thousand Sunny all the way to the end, so a little bit like that with their particular dreams. Um, there was even an SBS question. Somebody asked, 
cast a few volumes back where like, hey, is Nami still doing that draw the map of the world thing? Because it's not something we really address that much in the story. We don't really see her drawing maps that much in the story. She's, of course, the navigator, but we never see Nami like, okay, I'm going to draw out a detailed map of these ocean currents. Here you go, Luffy, and we get to see the map. Or I'm going to draw a detailed line of this island. Here you go, Luffy. We don't really see that much, so I can understand why somebody would ask a question in the SBS revolving around Nami's map. Um, and, there, and Oda's like, oh yeah, no, she still draws it, but I can't like show that like every single moment. So it's explained like every night on the sunny after dinner, Nami takes a shower or a bath and she sits down in her quarters. And that's basically what she does before she goes to bed every night is she draws out more maps and stuff of the places that they've journeyed. They're not all going to be island maps, of course. Her goal is to draw a, a conclusive map of the entire world, um, which also confirms right then and there that that doesn't exist. And keep in mind of how limited the one piece world is in terms of travel like you know geography is everything of course we've discussed this ad nauseum at this point but you know most people that are born in the north blue are probably going to stay in the north blue because traveling to another ocean is very very dangerous and just you know very difficult for most people if you're a regular civilian if you're like a farmer or a baker living in some random island in the north blue you're probably never going to go and see the south blue you're probably never going to cross the red line and the grand line to get down into the freaking south blue okay so you're just kind of stuck there, right? So there's probably detailed maps of each individual ocean uh, that are about as detailed as they could be for the time period, right? Uh, there's no internet or anything in the One Piece world. There's no satellite mapping or anything like that. But there's probably pretty detailed maps for the four blues. Then when you get into the Grand Line, things get kind of difficult. Uh, and then when you get into the New World, even more so, right? I'm sure the Marines have pretty good maps of the New World, you know, as best as in the world. And the world government has maps of that stuff. But nobody's made, like, a conclusive world map. Like, a giant world map or, like, a globe of the One Piece world. Except that time in Ohara when we saw a globe of the One Piece world. Uh, hmm. Um, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, so, crap. Okay, that doesn't mean just because we saw the globe at Ohara, that doesn't mean that was an actual accurate globe of the One Piece world. They could have been missing some parts there. And also, Ohara kind of got bombed into oblivion, so that globe is no longer there. That might have been the only globe in the entire world, at Ohara, right there, and it's no longer there. So, Nami might have to pick up the pieces there. Also, I'm just going to bring this up with Nami's dream, like... Even when they get to the end of the Grand Line, they get to the end of the New World and she maps that out. Um, you know, there's plenty of islands in the Grand Line she never visited, you know? Like, she never visited Karakuri Island where Frankie got sent, so how would she be able to map that out? Um, unless she's already using, like, her goal is to not draw out maps of every single island in detail, but her goal is to draw a map of places that people have never drawn maps before. So, the New World, basically. So, nobody's ever drawn a map how to get to Laugh Tale or drawn Laugh Tale itself, really. She would be the first person to do that and i'm sure at the end of the story we're going to see like a giant map like a double page spread of like nami's epic adventure i was thinking about this the other day uh where maybe at the end of one piece they're going to have an epilogue where oda's going to do like two three four chapters for each straw hat and their end epilogue you know so like here's the end of nami's journey it's five chapters where she goes back to kokoyashi village and reunites with nojiko and genzo and everyone there and we get to see nami's map and then we have Sanji's final chapter epilogue where he returns to the Baratier and he talks about finding the all blue to Zeph and everything and you know like may maybe they might do something like that kind of like the we can't study idea if you're reading that right now where they the, the series is ending but they're doing like the different routes you know so they might do something like that with the straw hats uh, Oda might do that I'm not sure so in terms of difficulty like if she's straight up I'll tell you what if she's straight up trying to draw a detailed map of the entire planet from the North Pole to the South Pole, the Red Line, all four blues, the Calm Belts, the Grand Line, Paradise, and the New World, um, all those places that have been unexplored, she's not going to be able to get that done by the end of the New World. I mean, she's going to have to travel all over the place to get it. So if that's the case, I'm going I'm to give her a Kaido. I'm going to give her a 10, because that would be insanely difficult in a world without modern GPS and like satellites and stuff to make a map like that, right? 
But if her goal is to simply just, you know, draw a map of the places that people really have never gone before, like the latter half of the New World and draw detailed currents of that. Um, places like Wano, where people don't really go very often. Not a lot of outsiders go to Wano, so draw a map of that place. If that's her goal, I would probably bump it down to like a 9. <laughs> uh, maybe an 8 there. Maybe getting close to an Aka Inu in rank. But still, that would be very, very difficult. Uh, next up, we have Zoro. All right, Zoro's is very simple, much like Luffy. Zoro wants to be the greatest swordsman in the world. How do you become the greatest swordsman in the world? Well, of course, you got to defeat the current greatest swordsman in the world, which right now in the story, that would be Dracul Mihawk. All right. And once Zoro defeats Mihawk, then boom, he gets the title. He's the greatest swordsman in the world. Now, here's the thing, though. Is Dracul Mihawk going to be the greatest swordsman when Zoro fights him? Now, that seems to imply, like, what Oda was setting up at the Barati and everything. Like, Dracul Mihawk is the greatest swordsman. Zoro's like, I will defeat you someday. But then we have the time skip where Zoro trained with Mihawk for two years. That threw a lot of people off. That got a lot of people thinking that that's a little bit weird that he would do that. Because he's like, man, this is Zoro's ultimate goal. And it was a very impactful moment for Zoro because he bowed before Mihawk. And Mihawk even said it. He's just like, you are willing to throw your dream away or put your dream aside for the sake of losing. Luffy's dream. My god, that is insane. And he, Mihawk even laughed at that. Very rarely do we get to see Mihawk express, express an emotion, you know what I mean? Um, but what if Mihawk is defeated in between now and when Zoro fights the greatest swordsman? What if Mihawk is defeated by Shiryu uh, in kind of like an underhanded backstabby kind of way? Uh, then, you know, Mihawk would no longer be fit to fight. No matter where he gets killed or even injured to the point where he can no longer fight. And so Shiryu begins to take that title as the greatest swordsman in the world. Then it would be Zoro fighting Shiryu. So either way, this would be very, very difficult you know what? My logic here is Zoro has trained very, very hard. And Zoro has definitely uh, trained with Mihawk for two years. Maybe not directly with Mihawk, like sparring every single day. Uh, in the anime, they did that, like uh, the baboons. Like Zoro had to fight the king of the baboons for a little bit. So maybe a lot of training from Mihawk was offhanded. Like Mihawk was like, you know, until you master armament hockey, you cannot uh, drink booze anymore. And then like Mihawk just walked away. Like he wasn't even part of that training. Like Zoro had to figure it out for himself. I like to think at the end of his training, he had one sparring match with Zoro with, with Mihawk. And that's where he got the scar. That's kind of how that went down. Um, but just because Zoro and Mihawk kind of have a relationship together right now, like a master-student kind of relationship, I feel like if they fought, there might be a thing where Zoro, like, okay, I trained for two years, I kind of know how he, how he, you know, moves, I kind of know how he uses his sword a little bit more now, because I've kind of studied him for a while. And I don't want to get into the whole idea where Mihawk would be like, go easy on Zoro. He wouldn't. But it's like this idea that like Mihawk trained Zoro for two years. He lived on his island for two years along with Perona. And maybe maybe Mihawk might be like, uh, oh, this is this is my student. This is I am his sensei. This is my student, and I kind of want to see him succeed. Something like that. Uh, Mihawk's kind of a hard guy to read. I'm going to kind of throw out there maybe a not a 10, maybe a 9 in that regard. Maybe if Zoro fought Mihawk now, it'd be a 9 on the... Uh I'm basing that on Zoro getting stronger and studying Mihawk's skills and how he moves and how he fights and using that to his advantage. Um, and then maybe if Mihawk is the one to get defeated and then Zoro has to fight somebody else like Shiryu, I guess it could be somebody else, but Shiryu is like the most likely candidate right now. Um, that would be more of a 10 because Shiryu fights in a much more underhanded way. He's got the invisibility fruit and Zoro's never even encountered Shiryu, so he wouldn't even know how he fights to begin with. Um... But it would be a very difficult battle for Zoro. But, I mean, of course he's going to win at the end of the day. Zoro's going to become the greatest swordsman. You know what? I, I, I wonder about that, though. I wonder if, Zor if, if Oda's going to have it where, like, every Straw Hat realizes their dreams. He could maybe spin it in a way where one of the Straw Hats or more don't realize their dream exactly but it's okay because they discovered something else that they care about more. Or it's like, it's all right. They, they themselves are okay. They can be accepting of that. I guess they could kind of, he could kind of spin it that way if he really wanted to, but I don't know. That would be still verily, I mean, you know, you want to see Zoro become the greatest swordsman in the world, right? So I'm going to put that on the back burner for right now, but it's just an idea. Um, moving on to Brooke. Okay, Brooks is actually not that difficult. Really, it isn't. All Brooke has to do to reunite with Laboon is just kind of make it through the journey in one piece. That wasn't so much of a skull joke, more of a One Piece joke, but I'll still do it. Yo-ho-ho-ho! -ho -ho! No! Brooke wants 
to reunite with his his good friend Laboon, who just happens to be a giant whale. Okay, so the Straw Hats make it to the end of the Grand Line, and they're literally on the other side of Reverse Mountain. Now, I think there is going to be something going on there where the Grand Line, I mean, where, when uh, the Red Line meets the Grand Line there, uh, the Reverse Mountain, Reverse Mountain's going to be destroyed in some way. That is a very, very popular theory that's existing right now. Also, the fact that if you look at Reverse Mountain from orbit, it's like an X, like X marks the spot. So people think, like, the Red Line's going to be destroyed, destroyed uh reverse mountain along with it and that's where kind of like sanji's dream is going to be realized the all blue because that'll be the point where all the oceans converge um and that also might have something to do with the ancient weapons and the one piece or whatever and rendering the world into one piece okay i'm just saying like it would kind of suck if the straw hats made it all the way to the end of the new world and so here's like laugh tail and here's the end of the the grand now here's the red line right here's reverse mountain right here but they can't like get on the other like because like, laboon is right there but they'd have to like travel over reverse mountain which would be very very difficult for them to accomplish it'd be easier just for the whole thing to just fall down right so they get to laugh tail they find the one piece maybe an ancient weapons there or something and then the whole reverse mountain just pfft, falls down and then laboon swims through it and then freaking that's where broken laboon are like laboon but even if that isn't the case, even if Reverse Mountain does not fall, all it would take is just time, right? Brooke would get there, he's like, okay, we managed to find the One Piece, we managed to make it here, and Luffy, you are now the Pirate King, but I now must be off to visit my friend Laboon. And then Brooke would literally have to, like, travel around the whole world again, you know, to make it to his friend. But I don't think that's the way it's going to work either, because remember, when, um, when Brooke joined the crew, he had that, like, inner dialogue there where he's like, Okay, Laboon, it took me a long time to make it to this halfway point, but I'm almost there. I just have to travel around the half, the other half of the world, and I'll be back to where you are. So I'm pretty damn sure that's how it's going to happen. I think the red line is going to be destroyed. Reverse Mountain's going to fall. Laboon's going to, you know, and Laboon is already trying to smash through the red line. I think that might be foreshadowing with Otis queuing up here. And then, you know, that's how they get reunited. But even if that wasn't what happened, all it would take is more time for Brooke to travel around. And Brooke is a very talented pirate. He's very strong. I think he would be able to travel from one end of the world to the other relatively simply. It would just take a really long time, and he would have some difficult fights along the way, but I think Brooke would be able to do it. So I'm going to put it, in terms of difficulty, really, I'm going to say, like, a 5. Maybe even lower than that. I'll go with a 5. I'll go right in the middle, because really, at the end of the day, it's just survive long enough to make it to this location and you know it's not like Sanji where you don't know where the all blue is you know where this location is so I think it should be okay also the Straw Hats might find a flying machine at some point Frankie might outfit the Sunny so it can fly right over Reverse Mountain so here's Laugh Tail here's Reverse Mountain here's Laboon and like Frankie's like all right hold on Brooke super Laboon, I missed you! Oh, hey, Crocus, how you been? I'm good, Brooke. It's good to see you alive. Well, I'm dead, but... Yo, Laboon! <laughs> it could be something stupid like that. It would be stupid, but great. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be that difficult for Brooke. Um, I think this is where I'm putting Jinbei right here. So let's just talk about Jinbei's. Jinbei's is a little bit more abstract. Jinbei has not a desire for a location, nor does he want to um, make something physical like Nami making a map. He wants to make a whole new world, a whole new era where fishmen and humans can live together under the same sun. Hence the Sun Pirates. This was the dream of Otohime. Um, Fisher Tiger named them the Sun Pirates. You know, he's carrying on both of their legacies. And this has been Jinbei's dream for a very, very long time now. Uh, Jinbei even went through phases of his life where he, like, despised humans or he wasn't sure how he felt about humans. Um, but right now where we're at in the story after dealing with uh, Horty Jones and after the whole thing with Arlong and, of course, Fisher Tiger and Odahime from Jinbei's past and everything and recent events, Jinbei has decided, you know, this is what I want. I will carry on their wills, okay? And, of course, in order for that to happen, you basically have to have the entire time. Henry Obito system collapse and the whole idea of slavery collapse as well in the One Piece world so that can be abolished well good news for you Gene Bay because Dragon is kind of already on that <laughs> Dragon's already there helping them out Hack is a fishman who's working for the revolutionaries kind of the same idea there for him I'm sure a lot of the fishmen on Fishman Island and even more so ever since Horty was defeated remember that scene after Horty was defeated and Madame Charlie's there and kind of like you know uh, children of Fishman Island I want you to pay attention to this moment right now because this is like a turning point in our history where, you know, Horty basically grew up hating humans without ever really, like, he even said it best, like, humans have never done anything to me, I just hate them. You know, it's just 
just that that hatred that bubbled up from like Arlong's time, you know, polluted the minds of the youth of Fishman Island that was Horty at the time, and then he grew up hating humans as well. So they're trying to change this whole thing. They're trying to change it. So I think very much like how I said about the Red Line being destroyed, um, the Red Line where Marie Joie is is going to be destroyed as well, and so that city is going to crumble, and the Tenerubito system is going to be abolished, and they're going to have to use the Noah to kind of like, I think Fishman Island is going to be destroyed in the process, but that's kind of okay. They are losing their ancestral homeland, but they can use the Noah so everybody can survive. The Noah will be towed to safety by the Sea Kings, led by Shirahoshi's power of Poseidon. This story is a little complicated when I really start getting into everything. And then the Noah will rise from the ocean and they'll like start their new Fishman Island at the top of like the rubble where like the, the city of Marie Joise once stood. It's just like a pile of rubble in the ocean when the red line collapses. It's like at sea level. And then that's where like the new Fishman Island will be built under the sun. And then the further generations of all of the humans will come together and kind of like sing Kumbaya. They'll live in peace and harmony in a world with no slavery and fishmen and humans are, you know, they're, they're uh, living in peace. That's that's Gene Bay's dream. So yeah, I think at the end of the day, I'm gonna give this an Aki Inu. I'm gonna give it an Aki Inu for Gene Bay's dream. Very difficult to do, but when you factor in all the revolutionary armies and Dragon and everybody, uh, it's it's definitely feasible. Definitely feasible. Moving on to Chopper's dream. Chopper wants to become the greatest doctor in the world, which of course means, as we all know, he has to slay the current greatest doctor in the world, which is either Law or Dr. Kareha. It sucks, too, because, you know, Dr. Kareha raised Chopper and everything, and there was that one time Law let Chopper ride on his hat, so that was also an emotional moment there, but Chopper's gonna have to kill one of them, or maybe both, to become the truly the greatest doctor in the world, and, um, yeah, that's gonna be really difficult for Chopper, it's gonna be an emotional moment, but, uh, I think it's possible. I think if he goes monster point, I think he could basically get rid of Kareha pretty easily. And uh, Law is going to be more difficult because he's got his shambles. But um, I'm going to give a 5 for Kareha and a 10 for Law. But he could achieve this. He could achieve this goal. Now, of course. So Chopper just wants to be the uh, all-curing medicine. He wants to be the doctor that can cure any illness. All right? Um, you know what? I think Chopper is well on the way to achieving that. Chopper is already a first-rate doctor. He's always learning more. When they arrived at Punk Hazard, he was, like, doing the tests and the experiments on the kids that Caesar was, well, Caesar was running the experiments and turning them into giants, and he figured out the nature of the drug and everything. Um, you know, he wasn't able to formulate a cure for that right then and there, because it was a really complicated thing that Caesar had did with them, you know, years of experimentation. Um, but he did come up with a cure for Queen's, um, virus very easily, the mummy virus, some are plagues, you know, and the way Chopper described it when he cured the the plague was like, oh, it was really easy to make antibodies for this thing. You know, I, I think uh, I think it's more difficult than he was making it out to be. I don't think just any random doctor in the One Piece world would be able to cure Queen's plagues like that. I think it would be a lot more, you know, because if it was that easy, you know, Queen's going on, you know, those, qu those, uh, those Queen plague bullets he makes, they're all over the world, I would imagine. Like, like Kaido has a giant empire, basically. He's sending out people all over the world to destroy towns and ravage locations. So you you know that Queen is making these plague bullets, sending them all over the area and using them for warfare. If it was that easy to cure the damn stuff, you know, it'd be they wouldn't even be that much of a threat, right? So for Chopper, I think he was saying like, wow, this was really easy to make antibodies for these plagues. Um, but in the reality, for a regular doctor, it'd be very very difficult. I think Doctor Kareha and Law would also be able to make cures for these very easily as well. But that doesn't take it away from Chopper's. So I think Chopper is well on the way to making a cure for pretty much every illness. He's not there yet. Um, there might be a point in the story where Chopper uh, finds somebody with a disease that uh, is really, really difficult, like Doc Q. Maybe Chopper's gonna go up against Doc Q, and Doc is like, because Doc Q is only like in his 20s, and he looks like a sickly old man, and he's like, oh, I'm not gonna make it! And Chopper realizes maybe the disease that he has, and he's like, okay, well, what if I find a cure for your disease? And it could be something like, you know, they bring up like, no, nah, it's okay. I have this disease I contracted when I was a kid. It's the most it's the most incurable disease in the world or something. And Chopper's like, oh, nobody's ever been able to cure that disease. It, it could be the rare, um, the rare, uh, oh, 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 what was that line that a Tweedledoofer? That was that line from the Four Kids dub where Kareha was like, only a complete Tweedledoofer would do that. It's the Tweedledoofer disease, you know? Freaking Doc Q is, I was afflicted with Tweedledoofer-itis when I was four. And Chopper's like, Tweedledoofer-itis? Even Dr. Kareha wasn't able to cure that. Law, have you ever heard of it? I sure have, Chopper. Tweedledoofer-itis, even me and with my all my oppy-oppy powers wouldn't be able to cure that disease. 
<laughs> and then there's the challenge. There's uh, Chopper's ultimate challenge to become the greatest doctor ever. Curing the disease Doc Q has. Um, but I think he's doing pretty good for himself. I'm gonna put him at a. I'm gonna put it at a six for Chopper. I think he's. He's. I think it's feasible for him. I think not quite an Akainu. You know, you're getting there, but I think it's. I think he's okay. There's a lot of other diseases in the world we probably yet to experience yet. What about the disease that Roger had? Roger might have had a case of Tweedledoo faritis. You know, it's just incurable. Luffy might contract the same disease, and then Chopper's gonna have to cure that shit. So yeah, six though. I think he'll be able to do it. Why not? Frankie's dream. He wants to see the Thousand Sunny, his ship that he carries on in the legacy of the Going Merry and the legacy of his master, Tom. He wants to see this ship right here reach the end of the new world, just like the Oro Jackson did, just like Roger's ship that was built by Tom. Um, I think the Sunny's gonna be fine, guys. Frankie is a first-rate shipwright. Even Usopp is learning some stuff along the way, so you basically kind of have, like, two shipwrights at this point. One that's kind of more of, like, an apprentice. But you know Frankie would be teaching uh, Usopp all about this stuff, right? Um, yeah, honestly, like, I, I don't see any problem with the Sunny not reaching the end of the Grand Line. I mean, we're with reaching the Grand Line, because it's, like, it's made out of ad atom wood. It's the most durable material on the planet, and Frankie, like, literally is so awesome, he can make, like, remember that scene in Thriller Bark when Frankie's like, oh, man, we need to get across this chasm. Frankie's like, eh, give me, like, two minutes. <laughs> Makes a freaking bridge, like, an immaculate bridge in the span of, like, less than two minutes. I mean, it's anime, it's manga, it's, like, a comedy, but... Like, that's how awesome Frankie is. A freaking, we just saw this recently in Wano. A whole cave-in happened on the Sunny. And Frankie and Usopp were able to patch it up pretty quickly. All they said was like, oh yeah, there was a cave-in, but, you know, the sail got damaged a little bit. We had to fix that. But, you know, beyond that, the ship itself was fine. The Sunny is durable, okay? The Sunny is thick. There's no way the Sunny is going down, all right? Now, we just did a whole video on the Mary uh, burning and everything like that. I don't think we're ever going to do that again with the Sunny. That's not going to happen. Uh, the Sunny will, for now and probably forever, be the Straw Hats ship with Frankie being the shipwright. So, yeah, I I'm honestly going to put it at a Foxy. I don't see this being very difficult. As long as Frankie stays alive and he's his super self and the Sunny's made out of this durable material, I think we'll be okay. Even with Big Mom ravaging the ship. I think Frankie already repaired all of that damage already. So, we're gonna be fine with Frankie. Next up, we have Robin. And Robin, of course, wants to discover the mystery of the Void Century. I would say this is fairly difficult, but when you actually think about it, all she needs to do is find the Rio Poneglyph. And the Rio Poneglyph would be located at, uh, well, we find out later the real Poneglyph makes up nine different Poneglyphs. That's what we find out during Totland, okay? Now, does that mean, like, nine Poneglyphs, real Poneglyphs, scattered all over the world, and she kind of, like, already saw some of those and wrote, wrote them down? Or does that mean, on Laugh Tale, there are nine Poneglyphs that are, like, in a circle, like Stonehenge or some shit, where Robin can just, like, look at them and be like, all right, that's part one, part two, part three, part four and just go all the way down. The way Rayleigh described it was, yeah, we reached the end of the Grand Line and we found the Rio Poneglyph and we learned about the Void Century. So one can assume if you reach Laugh Tale, Robin will find the Void Century one way or the other. Um, the difficulty of getting to Laugh Tale will be very difficult. The difficulty of reaching this place will be difficult. Go figure. Um, but the Straw Hats are definitely going to make it there. They're working together. Robin has the skills to read the Poneglyph. She's a very accomplished fighter. She's super strong. You got the other Straw Hats to help her out and protect her if, if, if like, the world government comes after her again. Uh, like, CP0 comes after her to try to capture her again or some shit. Uh, I think the Straw Hats are going to make it to Laugh Tale. They're going to find the other... The, 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 the most difficult part here is probably going to be finding the last road Poneglyph. Finding the last road Poneglyph, wherever that is, reading that, and then going to Laugh Tale. Apparently... The way Rayleigh described it, it's like, yeah, yeah, make it to Laugh Tale and you'll find out the true history of the world. So as long as they can get to the island, they find the Poneglyphs. Most people in the world can't read them. Very few people can, but Robin can, so that's not difficult at all. At the end of the day, I think it's going to be a moment where Robin finds the Rio Poneglyph, walks into the center of this, like, circle of Poneglyphs, and she reads it, and then it's going to be through Robin that we're going to get. That's going to be the framing device for the Void Century arc. Where we're, we're going to finally find out like what was going on during where we're going to finally find out what was going on during the era of Joy Boy and everything like Robin's like sitting there reading and she's like, oh, my God, this is this is incredible. And then Luffy and Sanji and Usopp are going to be like, what does it say, Robin? And Robin's like, OK, 
I'll translate it for you guys. Are you ready to learn the history? I can read it for you. And she's like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, yeah, do it, Robin. Do it, Robin. And be like, okay, here we go. So the story begins 900 years ago. And I was like, ah! And we're all like, ah! You know, it could be something like that. So um, reaching the end of the Grand Line is going to be difficult. I'll I'll give it a... I'll give it... I, I was going to give it a six. I'll give it a seven. I'll give it an Aka Inu. I'll give her an Aka Inu in that regard there. Um, because yeah, just the fact of reaching that place, but she already knows how to read them. So I think it'll be okay when she finally gets there. Okay. Moving on to Sanji. Sanji wants to find a specific location, the all blue, but it's a little bit more tricky because we don't really know if the all blue exists. Um, many people believe that right now in the story, it doesn't exist. There was that filler episode during water seven, the post water seven arc where they find the old man and the salt and like, there's only one ocean in the world where this much salt could come from. It's like, oh, all blue. Yeah, maybe, you know, so that was a filler though. It was one of the better filler episodes in the entire series, but it was still a filler. Um, I'm still going to go along with my idea of the red line being destroyed. That's not my idea. This is a theory that's been around since like the early 2000s. This has been out there. Um, but it's an idea that the red line is going to be destroyed. And if the red line is destroyed, then the oceans are obviously going to all mix together and converge. Hence, all blue created. So I'll give him a six. I'll give Sanji a six. I think he's going to find the all blue. He's on the way. Or you could give it a Gaimon. You could give it a zero because... Even if Sanji, even if he reaches the end of the Grand Line and they find out, like, oh yeah, the All Blue really was just a myth. It, that ocean just doesn't exist. Sanji could always be like, oh, well, I already found the All Blue. It was Fishman Island with all the mermaids. Like, okay, Sanji, that's cool. You know what? You know what? Whatever makes you happy, Sanji. There you go. Fine. You found the All Blue. Good for you. And so he's like, yeah, I'm just going to spend my time there. I'm like, okay, then. He found the All Blue. Good for him. So it's either an Aka Inu or a Gaimon. Pick which one. And then finally, we're going to round this out with Pirate God D. Usopp uh, and his dream to become a brave warrior in the sea. Uh, a brave warrior of the sea. I guess he could be a brave warrior in the sea, but also of the sea. Gaimon. I, like, do you think Usopp... I think he already kind of became a brave warrior of the sea. All right, man, he he defeated a giant mole at Alabasta. He became god at Dressrosa. Usopp went up against Enaru. all right? Yeah, he is a coward. Yeah, he does have his... Oh, man, I can't go to that island disease. Um, It's not as dangerous as Tweedledoofer-itis, but it's up there. You know, like, I get it. I do. It's comedy for Usopp. But when the chips are down... Usopp is always, he, he, you know, he always, you know, makes it, he rises to the challenge. He always does. All right. He might be scared. He might be shaking along the way. He might be sweating profusely, but he's like, I'll take you on, Do Flamingo, if he really, really has to do it. And there's like nobody else. Like if it's a moment where like Luffy's fighting Blackbeard and Luffy's dead to rights and he's on the ground and he's unconscious and he's bleeding out and Blackbeard's about ready to deliver the coup de gras right on Luffy. Even if Usopp knows he doesn't have a chance in hell against the Yami Yami and the Gura Gura and whatever crazy power Blackbeard has at that point, Usopp, you know, would rise to the challenge and he would jump in front of Luffy and he would, he would freaking defend his uh, captain to the end of the day. You know he would do that, all right? I think he's already become a brave warrior of the sea. I think he already meets that freaking criteria. All right. He's got insanely powerful abilities. He's got the dials. He's got the pop greens. He's got I in godly sniper skills. Um, you know what I mean? Like, he's got the physique for it. Now, does he consider himself a brave warrior of the sea? Maybe he wouldn't consider himself a brave warrior of the sea yet until maybe, um, he reaches Elbaf or something. Uh, that would actually be a really cool moment. Like, he lands at Elbaf, and he's like, oh, maybe the giants could teach me what it really means to be a brave warrior. But then the giants might see Usopp in action, like, fight against an opponent, and the giants might be like, oh, 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 little god man, you are already a brave warrior of the sea. I think you were already won for plenty of battles now. And Usopp's like, <gasps> I think he's already achieved his dream right now. But uh, if you want to do something else, like that was me personally, my opinion. But if maybe from Usopp's perspective, he hasn't, I'll give him a solid Foxy. <laughs> I think he's going to make it. I think he's going to be just fine. Okay. It's just, maybe it's like, maybe the thing that I really just wanted to, the, the thing that truly makes me the greatest warrior in the sea is my confidence that I'm a brave warrior of the sea. That's that's a quote right there. That that should be in a book somewhere. 
All right. Let me know what you think about the Straw Hats dreams below and how difficult they are going to be to achieve, uh, like logistical aspects of it, like with Nami's maps or finding the all blue or like things that are a little bit more ambiguous, like Usopp's Brave Warrior of the Sea thing. Let me know. Let me know what it is. All right. So anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching 101 signing out.